Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Diamonds 2020. We are on day three, and today we are starting the day off with a session from Kara Swanson. And I have been looking forward to this session since she told me that it was a possibility. So I hope that you enjoy it, and I will turn it over to Kara. Thank you so much, Sarah. Hi, my name is Kara Swanson. Um, I'm the Y author of two novels, and I forgot to bring them last time, so I thought I would hold them up to show you. This is The Girl Who Could See, um, which is a my novella um, that I mentioned in my previous talk um, that I wrote that kind of helped me work through the transition of being a missionary kid and coming back to the US. And then this is my other novel, um, a Peter Pan retelling called Dust that recently uh, went up for pre-order. So, all right, <clears throat> let's go ahead and dive right in. My session today is called Boundaries and Pacing Yourself. <laughs> Um, and we are going to be doing a Q&A at the end of my session. So if you have any questions or any reactions or any thoughts for me, please feel free to go ahead and comment them in the chat and I will get around to answering them um, when we yeah, when we finish up here. Um, good morning, Haley. Oh, I'm so excited that you're here. Um, thank you for your kind words. All right, let's go. Balance. It's one of the most important things when battling a chronic illness, knowing the balance between when to push yourself and when to not go so far that you crash. It's that balance between getting back on your feet and knowing when to rest. This balance can be so vital to maintaining a heart healthy and physically healthy outlook on life and healing. But how do you find that balance? And more importantly, once you find that balance, how do you actually protect it? We're going to be talking about boundaries today. But this is a topic that can sometimes be defined in various different ways. However, in this session, when I refer to boundaries, I basically mean practically striking a balance that allows you to grow without being pushed beyond what is healthy, protecting that middle ground and that balance that you need to survive. Before I continue, I want to preface the rest of this talk by saying that I recognize that there are so many varying levels and challenges that chronic illness warriors face and my personal experience will be very different than a lot of yours. So when I dive into talking about boundaries, please understand that this is heavily influenced by my own experiences, my own realm of understanding, and I know that not every aspect of this will apply to every single person. But I hope that you will hear me when I say this. I know what it's like to be so weary, physically and spiritually, that you feel like life is just slipping through your fingers, that the desire to even breathe is no longer there that you're not sure how to move forward even an inch. And I hope that some of my story, some of the things that have helped me and the heart behind what I have to say in some way might encourage you. That the heart of what I have to say might connect with your heart in a special way that our savior has a habit of doing. I've been praying for everyone coming to this event and I've been praying for you as well, warrior heart. So with that said, let's go ahead and move forward to the bulk of our session. All right, so when dealing with chronic illness, most of us battle fatigue and weariness in some way. But at the same time, feeling as if we've accomplished something can make the biggest difference in a day. Those tiny stair steps of triumph. But how do you learn to navigate the overwhelming weariness while still progressing in small ways? How do you find balance and protect your boundaries while still growing and moving forward? Well. I think that actually a lot of these aspects are connected, but I think that there is only one place to truly start. When I was able to begin to understand this specific thing, it really helped me in navigating and doing what I could to thrive while still being chronically ill. So if you're taking notes, I'm gonna repeat my main points so that you guys can um, write them down if you need to, or just let them sink in a little bit more. So my first point is this, there are different kinds of exhaustion, and I'll say that again. There are different kinds of exhaustion. First off, I wanna to touch on a type of weariness that goes beyond boundaries or balance. This kind of weariness I like to refer to as soul weariness. Soul weariness is a deep kind of exhaustion that sets into your bones beyond just physical pain. It's a kind of tiredness that can oftentimes come from feeling like you've been beat down again and again and again. when it's hard to know how to get back up, when you've hit a spiritually dry spell, or when the friendships and relationships in your life have perhaps taken more than they've ever given, when you feel hopeless, thinking that things might actually never change, 
that it can only get harder. And when you're afraid that the suffering might eventually just drown you. And friends, there's no easy answer to that kind of weariness, no number of boundaries that can fully protect your heart from that kind of hopelessness, no magic here. There is only one way that I know to refill your soul from that kind of exhaustion. And that is by drawing close to the one who bore our pain. By drawing close to the one who can step into our sorrow and our weariness and give us strength. By asking the real raw questions of our God, meeting him on our knees, and finding a kind of strength through him that defies logic. Because only the maker of our hearts can truly refill them when we are weak. So before I dive into the bulk of our session on boundaries and what that will be about, I wanted to preface this by taking a little deeper look at the heart weariness that only God can fill. I especially love the reminder tucked into Psalm 119.28. It says, my soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. We are not alone, friends. We are not abandoned. Even in the shadows, even in the pain, even in the unknown, we are seen and we are found. And he lifts even the weakest of hearts. Sometimes we just need to slow down, step back and soak ourselves in the word and the reminders of the God who sees us. All right, so next up, I'm going to continue to discuss two various types of strength. Continuing on, um, we're going to talk about two different types of strength. I believe that there are basically two types of strength. Um, one is a heart strength and another is called a physical strength. Um, strength of heart is when we ground our identity and our peace, not in how we feel, but in the one who loves us so abundantly and is working all things for our good. It's a sort of heart courage, even in the darkness. And that heart courage, I think, also ties into the soul weariness that I was talking about. When it comes to pacing yourself and having healthy boundaries, one of the most important aspects of this is using healthy boundaries to protect your heart strength. Sometimes this means just understanding yourself and understanding your own heart and your own emotional health. Especially in the context of mental health, it can be really, really, really important to have healthy boundaries in place to protect the emotional energy needed to maintain better mental health. So for example, with me personally, I have found that when I'm dealing with depression and or anxiety, um, that oftentimes the first and most helpful thing besides prayer and sitting at the feet of our savior is to rest. Oftentimes my own fatigue or my lack of sleep or anything like that can trigger or affect my depression. So I have found that boundaries are not simply about protecting my physical health, but they are also about being careful to not overdo it to the point that I fatigue myself and negatively affect my own mental health. Boundaries protect your heart strength just as much as they protect your physical strength. Does that make sense? I think that discovering what those triggers are that might affect your mental health is really, really helpful. Of course, with mental health, a lot of times it may not actually be specifically triggered by something tangible, and rarely is there a perfect or simple fix. But I think being aware of the things that can make our hearts heavy and doing what we can to protect our strength of heart is really vital. When you are dealing with such severe chronic illness symptoms, I think it's really easy for us to focus on the external things and forget that our hearts you know, and our minds are equally as important. So I believe that one of the first and most important aspect of boundaries is finding the balance that allows you to protect your mental health just as much as realizing that physical exhaustion can also leak into your emotional state. They all sort of tie together. As a few examples, protecting your heart strength might mean being careful not to push yourself too far in daily activities, engaging with people who are life-giving instead of draining, prioritizing spiritual growth and making it to church if you're able to, etc. Having those who check in on you and keep you accountable, staying daily connected with God's word and the encouragement there, listening to uplifting music, prioritizing getting as much rest as you need, having safe people to process through your mental health needs with, and so much more. Um, that's great that you're learning some of your triggers for depression. Um, some of these things may not seem to clearly tie into boundaries or pacing yourself, but with anything, having limited energy means that you need to prioritize and pursue some of these things that will protect and nourish your emotional, emotional needs. And there may be other aspects of er other areas in your life that you need to kind of slip away in order to protect your heart strength. Does all of that make sense? All right. So aside from the emotional strength, I believe there is also a physical kind of strength. 
This is the practical strength that allows you to get out of your bed and function. When it comes to physical strength, how do you find the practical side of just existing, living life, when you're battling an illness that seems to affect every tiny amount of energy that you expel? This is a question that I know far too well. When I was first diagnosed with Lyme disease, it was during my senior year of high school. I have had Lyme since I was 15, but it was during that year that my symptoms became the most extreme. Um, as I've said before, I was practically bedridden at that point. However, I already planned to attend a Bible college and being stubborn, <laughs> um, I did not want to have to sacrifice that. Um, so being an extrovert, I rallied all my strength so that I could try and push through. Um, as I said, being an extrovert, I was able to ride some of the spike of energy from being around people and doing something that I was excited about just enough to be able to get myself to college. I held out for about three weeks of attending college before the fatigue had me so exhausted that I called home, tears streaming down my face on the verge of having a panic attack and told my parents that I couldn't do it anymore. I pushed myself far too hard. I had been so desperate to feel normal that I was willing to ignore the signs that my body was giving me. But I wasn't normal, at least not in the sense that I really wanted to be, um, but that had to be okay. I couldn't live in denial of my own limitations or else I would just continue to hurt myself further. And that brings me to my next point. So my first point was that there are various different kinds of strength, heart strength and physical strength. Um, secondly, boundaries are healthy and important. And I'll repeat that again. Boundaries are healthy and important. This kind of seems like a duh, but I think sometimes we need permission to acknowledge that we may not always be able to keep up with everyone else and that that is absolutely okay. Knowing your limitations and setting healthy boundaries in place will allow you to find ways to remain heart healthy and perhaps even somewhat active during your illness. And listen when I say that boundaries are not a fearful reaction to your illness, but a healthy way to protect your emotional and physical healing. Now, you may be sitting there wondering, how do I identify my own limitations though? How do I know where to pace myself and where to slow down? I think honestly, a lot of this is just being self-aware. Um, taking note of your own unique symptoms and paying attention to see what might expend your energy or exhaust you and what might take less energy or even give you a boost. A lot of this will honestly just take time. Be sure to give yourself grace as you explore your own boundaries a bit. For some of you, this may mean that your energy levels are pretty depleted and pacing yourself might include something as specific as saving energy to walk across the room or only having visitors for a very short amount of time. For others, this might mean finding the balance between doing something like light housework or even taking a short walk, saving up energy for things like that. Whatever it is, whatever those limitations are, and that sense of pacing yourself and protecting your energy Take time to be well aware of what those things are. Perhaps you can keep a record of the times of day that you have more energy or the things that give you energy. Be sure to write those down. You're gonna to wanna to take note of those. And in the same way, maybe you can also keep track of things that deplete your energy, learning how much you can do and where to draw back. Um, it's, yeah, it's hard. I think especially for those of us who tend to be fairly driven and stubborn. Um, and who can rally just enough energy to push through for something, but then you crash after. Um, and so for me, it has been really, really helpful to just be very self-reflective um, and to try to pay attention. And I find that the more boundaries you set in place, the more you learn how to say no, it does get easier over time. Um, and I think too, a lot of times there's this sense of guilt when you have to say no to something or when you have to pull back. Um, and that's kind of a constant battle for me in some ways, learning to um, give myself grace in that, learning to trust that um, God knows where I'm at as far as uh, emotionally and physically, um, and that saying no and having to pull back isn't something that needs to have some element of shame. Yes, resting is still being productive. I love that. Um, yeah, so I think just being willing to, um, yeah, to get to know yourself and get to know what your limitations and the things that drag you down and the things that actually give you more energy is really, really helpful. And that brings me to my third point. Be intentional about understanding your own unique limitations, not because those limitations define you, but because if you can understand yourself, your own health and needs better, then you will be able to thrive far more in this new sense of normal. 
And I will repeat that one again because it's pretty long. Be intentional about understanding your own unique limitations, not because those limitations define you, but because if you can understand yourself and your own health and needs better, then you will be able to thrive far more in this new sense of normal. As far as understanding what pacing yourself looks like, that will be an individual dynamic that each of us will have to figure out for ourselves. Be willing to give yourself grace as you learn to listen to your body and identify your own limitations. While again, I cannot speak in each of your unique situations and identify what pacing yourself might look like for each of you, since I don't know you, oh, I wish I did. Um, I can give some practical examples from my own experience that might help you to wrap your head around this a little bit more and perhaps spark some realizations of your own. So example one, know when to take on certain responsibilities and know when you really need to protect your time. For me personally, I was actually able to pick up some online virtual assistant jobs while I was sick because I could do those from my bed on my computer and at my own pace. There were other things, however, that I just did not have the energy for and I needed to be comfortable saying no to. Another potential example is knowing how to plan ahead on something like a meal and when to do something simple that you only have to invest a small bit of time into. Okay, let's be real. Cooking, man. I feel like cooking is a bigger thing than we usually get credit for. Um, I like to plan meals in advance. And especially when I was battling a lot of fatigue, if I was going to have to stand up in the kitchen for longer than a few minutes, I needed to preserve that energy and plan ahead. Most of the time I would make smoothies or coordinate with my family or have yogurt or whatever had protein didn't take too much prep time. But being aware of that process and planning ahead was really important. Um, yeah, I think cooking can be so much more exhausting than we realize. Um, and I oftentimes find what's tricky for me um, is that I will wake up needing protein. Um, and so I don't have time. If I take the time to make something longish, then by the time that I actually eat, I'm usually shaky and um, yeah, my symptoms have, you know, gotten significantly worse. Um, and then, you know, toss in like having to take medicine on top of that, um, you know, before or after you eat or with your meal, whatever, um, whatever that calls for. And so I think, yeah, even with something that's as commonplace as cooking or eating or planning a meal, um, even just being able to plan ahead for those things can be really, really important. Another example is if you just need alone time to just breathe or recharge or think, and as a tired extrovert, I need this too. Um, it is okay to create that time and protect it. I think sometimes we feel bad having to pull away and spend time to ourselves to rest. But I honestly think that it can be good for our hearts to have some quiet time and listen to the Lord. For some of you, you may be dealing with fairly severe symptoms and you might actually spend a lot of time alone. For others who are able to function a bit more actively, this may mean um, that rest is something you need to prioritize and not apologize for. It is okay if you need time to rest. It is okay if you need time, um, even just beyond physical rest for emotional rest, that is okay. Um, yeah, I think it's good for our hearts and our minds. All right, this brings us to my next point. Prioritize your physical healing and your spiritual healing first, and then communicate well with those around you to let the other things fall into place. And I'll repeat this again. Prioritize your physical healing and spiritual healing first, and then communicate well with those around you to let other things fall into place. If your physical healing needs include making sure that you are getting the treatments, taking pills at certain times, avoiding certain foods, having specific doctor visits, etc., 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 let those take precedence and schedule in time for those as a priority. When it comes to your spiritual health, this cannot be missed either. Take the time to dig into your word to attend church and Bible studies if possible. Connect with people who will encourage you in your spiritual walk to keep your heart strong and lifted. From there, other things such as laundry, housework, studies, or caring for your family, or even working a job, those things can taper down in varying degrees of priority. If you are a mother or responsible for, for providing for others besides yourself, that might make it even larger of a priority, but just be cautious not to overdo it. Um, I think that when it comes to learning how to actually uh, prioritize certain things, for me, things tend to feel overwhelming quickly. Um, and it's hard for me to know, okay, what's most important, what's not. And so for me, being able to prioritize my, my physical healing, my spiritual healing, um, and then being able to break everything else down from there into varying degrees of what is, you know, a priority, what is most important, what is not, has been really helpful. Um, because ultimately, 
your physical healing will lead into your ability to do more, period. So that is certainly important. Um, your physical healing also plays into your you know, emotional and heart um, aspect of things. And so that will also help there. Um, and so making those things a priority is important, not in such a way that it means that you um, may be totally disengaged. If you are able to still engage with your family or with different other types of responsibility, that is fantastic, of course. Um, but I have found that trying to keep those two things sort of centered in my mind. And then I would say after that family, um, that type of dynamic is important. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, I'm a huge lister. And so I tend to make lists. Um, and figure out, you know, what what tapers down together. Um, because I think too, when we get overwhelmed because there's so much to do and who knows what's most important, what's not, what do I do first, what do I do last, do I have energy for this, um, all those kinds of things, it just makes you stressed out and makes everything so much more difficult. I think that especially as you begin to make some progress and find that you can focus more and more on different and newer things, it can get harder and harder to balance those priorities. I know that has certainly been the case for me. But being able to identify what is most crucial and being able to give myself grace to let the less important things slide away has been really, really helpful. I can't necessarily say what that will look like for each of you individually, but I think sometimes just stepping back and taking stock of your responsibilities and priorities can be really helpful in knowing where to invest energy and where you need to actually preserve that energy. And then how to communicate those boundaries and priorities to those around you so they can have accurate expectations of what they can realistically expect from you. And very likely for a large amount of us, the physical and spiritual healing might be all that we can manage. And that's absolutely okay. There's definitely seasons like that. But I think knowing how to create boundaries and set and communicate expectations with people around you is really, really important. Um, if you can be healthy spiritually and physically, then everything else will follow. And if you can learn how to communicate those boundaries, if you can learn how to identify them and then communicate them earlier on, as you begin to feel better and as you actually begin to have more things you have to have boundaries with because you have more, it's, you know, the world opens up more, um, it will be really, really helpful for your own, um, just <laughs> your own growth as you're able to do more, to be able to continue to be able to set up boundaries and communicate them well. If you can do it with some of the smaller things, potentially they might still be very big, um, then you'll actually be able to continue to do so even as you heal, if that makes any sense. So those are some fairly specific examples of ways you can set up boundaries to varying degrees. As for the practical aspect of how these boundaries can come into play, that's going to depend on you, on your specific situation and needs and schedule. However, when it comes to setting boundaries in place, most likely will you will need to A, Define how much you can practically accomplish, and I will repeat these again for you. So A, define how much you can practically accomplish. B, communicate with others what they can expect from you and how you may need to step back in some ways and what areas you might need support from them in. So B, communicate with others what they can expect from you and how you may need to step back in some ways and areas that you may need support from them in. And then C, Schedule and make a practical point to carve out the time needed to protect your emotional and physical health. So C is to schedule and make a practical point to carve out the time needed to protect your emotional and mental health. So basically you're just going to define what you can actually do, communicate to others what that is, and schedule and be practical about making sure that you can actually do that. Um, in a lot of ways, having good boundaries is really just knowing how to say no to some things, and let's be real, some people <laughs> that push you too far, and how to search out the life giving dynamics that will help you grow and heal. All right, so moving on to my next point. Boundaries are not just about your own personal limitations, but they are also un about understanding your boundaries in the context of others. It goes both ways. Sometimes our boundaries and striking that balance is less about having to communicate your own practical, personal limitations <clears throat> and more about being able to see the healthy balance needed when interacting with other people. Knowing when people are healthy and life-giving and when to say yes to them and when to stand your ground with a no. We don't live in a bubble. And I think sometimes having a chronic illness affects the people around us nearly as much as it affects us ourselves. Managing that dynamic, whatever it looks like, is so very important. Whether that be having too much pressure from being in too many positions of responsibility, 
or being put in a mentoring position that you are too weary to be able to effectively pour into, or balancing the interpersonal dynamic with your family, or even the amount of time that you invest in just spending time with friends. We need to search out people who are life-giving, but even in the practical interactions that might fall into more of a gray area, we need to be able to effectively communicate our own needs and boundaries, both so that we can preserve the energy needed for our own health, but also so we can protect the energy we might need to invest in others. So again, a lot of it honestly is about communication and balance. So to briefly recap some of my main points here when it comes to boundaries, my point one was there are different kinds of exhaustion. Point two, there are different kinds of strength, heart strength and physical strength. Both are important, but they both actually need to be cultivated generally in somewhat different ways. Point three, be intentional about understanding your own unique limitations, um, not because these areas define you, but because you can understand your own health and needs better. Um, and then that way you can thrive far more in this new sense of normal. And point four, prioritize your own physical healing and spiritual healing first, and then communicate well with those around you to let other things fall into place. Uh, practically scheduling and communicating when your needed boundaries need to be put in place. Um, and then five, boundaries are not just about understanding your own limitations, but they are also about being able to communicate and navigate those limitations with other people. Does that make sense? Are you guys still following me? All right. So continuing our conversation about boundaries in the context of other people. Remember that there are people who are life-giving and there are people who are not. We have to know the difference because if we are surrounded, um, because if we are surrounded by people who are toxic or simply need more than we can give them, that can hugely affect our health. I think we oftentimes forget just how important it is to surround ourselves with life-giving friendships and how that can help us grow and really aid in having an uplifting perspective on the world. Um, I think. I think sometimes we assume that um, we can't be choosy in our friendships. You know, we have to kind of take what we get. Um, and especially as someone dealing with chronic illness, it's a little bit more rare, I think, to find really, really strong friendships, or um, at least it feels like it would be unusual to find someone who really connects and understands what you're going through. Um, but I think honestly, possibly more for us than for other people, it's important to be wise in who we spend time with and the kinds of people that we are engaging with because um, that emotional side of you know expectations, I think expectations are huge when it comes to boundaries. Um, not just you communicating your expectations, but understanding when other people have expectations that are just not healthy for you and that are really, really hard for you to navigate and manage. And so being able to um, have the freedom to know that it's not selfish, it's not unkind to be a little bit choosy in the types of dynamics and the types of friendships that you have. It's just simply wisdom um, and knowing your own boundaries and knowing, okay, I can handle engaging with this person now versus actually this is not really healthy for me at the moment. Um, knowing how much you have to give and that there are gonna be some people where for now, um, the healthiest thing is to pull back and to have some space um, from that dynamic for whatever reason. Um, as another example, I meet a people of, I meet a lot of people online and I have a lovely variety of friends, as I've talked about in my previous session. These opportunities are amazing, and I am so grateful to get to encourage and support and speak into so many lives. And that is an honor that I do not take lightly. But sometimes I could begin to feel like I was on call all the time. Having boundaries to clearly state what people can expect of you and to not commit to more than you can physically do is so important. This can even play, time, play into spending time with your family. Especially within a family unit, communication is really, really important. Knowing how much you have to give and invest in those around you will allow you to cultivate solid friendships where you can pour into people without feeling stretched so thin that you hardly have anything to give to anyone and are siphoning away the energy that should have gone into healing. Um, I feel like I just keep using this word balance, but I think it really it really um, applies well because um, I don't know. I, I mean, I like to think of energy almost like like you have this bowl of water, right? And you can only use so much in different areas. And so you have to be careful or um, there's a spoons analogy or, you know, whatever it is, but it's, it's finding that balance and it's knowing how much to invest in one place and how much to invest in another. Um, and I think too, realizing that 
Uh, friendship takes emotional energy. <laughs> it may not always take physical energy, but engaging with people, all of those dynamics, that certainly takes emotional energy, um, which definitely has a lot of weight in and of itself. And so being aware of that and being cautious of that can be really, really important for sure. All right, so like with your personal boundaries, the practical side of this, this um, boundaries with people will be unique to each person, but it will probably mean being able to, and I will repeat these points for you, but A, define how much you can practically give when it comes to pouring into relationships around you. So A, define how much you can practically give when it comes to pouring into relationships around you. B, communicate with others what they can expect from you and what you may need from them. Being careful to give as well, not just take. So B, communicate with others what they can expect from you and what you might need from them. And then C, schedule time to spend with people in such a way that you are still protecting your emotional and physical health. Schedule time to spend with people in such a way that you are still protecting your physical and emotional health. Um, so basically you're, communicate, you're defining um, what you can actually give, you're communicating those expectations, and then you're scheduling in time to practically do it. Now, scheduling in times with friends might seem like an odd thing. And I will admit that I'm a little bit of an overscheduler. But really, the idea here is knowing your own limitations and the extent of energy that you have to pour into something and invest in friendships around you and relationships um, and pouring out that energy in the right ways at the right time. You may not be able to engage with people at every single church function, but you might be able to have visitors, you know, once or twice a week. Um, whatever it is, whatever that dynamic looks like, I think being able to identify it, communicate it, and then practically, you know, implement it or schedule it um, is just really, really important. And I think, at, at least for me, I feel like breaking these things down into steps uh, helps me to make it feel more bite sized, um, like I can actually manage it. Um, and I mean, uh, I have been working in the publishing industry since I was in my high school, um, in my uh, yeah senior year of high school. Um, and so I have been navigating basically um, working from home on my own for years and years now. And so all of these things I do on a daily basis um, and I do them so often I don't even think about, you know, oh, I'm defining, I'm communicating, I'm scheduling, but I do um, in so many different areas, whether that be um, I mean, I, I suppose this conference is a good example. So I reached out and asked if I would be interested in doing it. Um, and so I had to basically define, you know, do I have the time? How much energy will that take? How long will it take to prep? What kinds of things do I feel like I can actually speak on? So I had to figure out for myself what that dynamic looked like. And then I communicated it to her and I let her know, hey, I have these two ideas. What do you think? Am I crazy? Um, and then explained how much time I thought it would take. Um, and then I scheduled it in and I scheduled in the days that we'd be doing the conference. But then I also, um, I like to take my time to do things. I don't like to rush. Um, I know there are people who like, you know, they like to cram the night before that kind of thing. I'm not one of those people. I'd rather be able to do it in bite-sized chunks over a longer period of time and actually feel like I'm breaking it down, but not stressing myself out over it. Um, and so for me, scheduling it in looked like, um, having a daily reminder to work on my sessions just a little bit um, at the very least to make sure that things are kind of coming together. Um, same thing goes with writing a book or, you know, working in the publishing industry. Um, I have to figure out how much energy I have every day to devote on something. I have to figure out how much time it will take, you know, from point A to point B to get a project finished. Um, and then I break it down into bite-sized chunks. And um, yeah, this, I mean, this can apply to lots of different things. If you are to the point to where you have more energy and you can invest in more than just simply um, uh, just simply, you know, working on the house or, or dynamics with people. If you are working from home or trying to keep up with other responsibilities and projects, um, this can be really helpful there as well. I use a lot of scheduling tools. Um, I actually used to not be very good at scheduling. And then I realized that I have a terrible memory because of brain fog and I would constantly forget things. So I use um, the uh, calendar, Word. I use the calendar on my computer um, and I schedule in things there. And then I also have an app called Wonderlist um, that also is really, really helpful because it sets reminders and it's a little like, it's a checklist and I love checking things off because it makes me feel triumphant in tiny ways. 
um, there's just something really satisfying about the like ding that it makes as you check things off. Um, and again, I feel like that sense of uh, progression and like you're actually doing something and you're navigating something well is very important. Um, so yeah, I think that if you are also attempting to do more, um, you know, maybe you're trying to work in certain responsibilities or there's aspects of things that you're trying to still um, succeed on. I think being able to use these tips and tools in those areas as well is really, really important. Defining and communicating and scheduling. So, and again, you don't have to schedule schedule. Um, you can, you know, basically the idea is to be intentional and to actually follow through whatever that looks like. Um, yeah. Oh, Sarah says that for her, she's found that making a weekly task list helps. That way, if she's feeling badly one day, she can adjust it to another day while still having a schedule. Yes, um, I have a weekly schedule and then I have daily tasks, but they're pretty, they're fairly loose. And so I will usually know that if I can't get something done, I'll just switch it to another day. Um, yeah. Oh, Haley says that she tries to have one to two major priorities each day and then a longer list of small tasks. Um, that would be nice if they happened, but no pressure. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I will have like, I would say maybe three things a day that like I'd need to try to get done. Um, but then other smaller things that don't matter quite as much. Um, but it's just still good. And I, I feel like too, I, I'm very forgetful. That's like one of the biggest things. Um, and even as I'm doing better and as I'm healing from Lyme, I still can be very forget forgetful. And so I think having lists is helpful. Even if I don't get everything done on the list, being reminded that it's there can be really, really helpful in and of itself. Also, coffee fixes everything. Just kidding, but also kind of not. Okay, so in conclusion, so when it comes to boundaries and pacing yourself, it really is about understanding your own limitations and being willing to have the boundaries needed to pour out your energies without exhausting your physical or emotional strength. Boundaries are about protecting your physical healing, prioritizing your spiritual growth, and also having a healthy way to be able to search out life-giving relationships while giving yourself grace if you may not be able to move as quickly as other people can. Boundaries are about learning to wisely function within the limitations that God has allowed for you to have for now. Learning how to identify those boundaries and set them in place is an ongoing process. And the more that you come to understand yourself better, the more you will learn that these boundaries that learn... Hmm, the more you come to understand yourself better, the more you will learn the boundaries that you need to protect. So give yourself grace in this process. Be willing to communicate well with those around you and be willing to experiment with boundaries until you find dynamics that will help you to salvage your energies while still engaging and pouring into those around you. Again, it's an ongoing process, especially like I've said, as you begin to heal and, and do better um, because yeah, the more that you are able to do, um, the more there will be to keep track of. <laughs> And the more there will be to have just that, um, I guess, the uh, temptation to push yourself too far and too hard. Um, so being willing to continue to basically just, um, yeah, be self-aware of your own limitations and your health and what that looks like and being willing um, to just be cautious with that is just really, really important. So um, yeah, so give yourself grace in this process. Be willing to communicate well with those around you. Um, and remember, even in all of this, that even in our weakness, we are not alone because we know a gracious God who can lend us his strength and discernment in times when we feel weary. And that even in our limitations, our Sorry, I accidentally clicked the mute button. Um, so I finished up a little bit early, um, but still pretty close. So I'm going to give you guys a little bit of time uh, to work on potentially coming up with um, some questions for me if you have any. Um, yeah, we have about, I would say, five minutes if you want to think up some questions and then I can go right into the Q&A. Um, I hope that was helpful. I enjoy speaking about these things. Um, I feel like there's a lot of practical aspects of chronic illness and working through these things that we don't always touch on um, or, you know, uh, yeah, that we don't always um, discuss. And so if there's ways that I can help um, and things that 
you know, make sense or apply to you, then I'm very happy to do that. So, yes. Um, and I want to say thank you again to Sarah for having me. This has been really, really fun. It's been fun to kind of kick off today. So, yay. I'm so glad that you guys enjoyed it. And hi, Anna. <laughs> um, Anna and I have been friends since I was, Jiminy, like 16. <laughs> um, for years and years now since I lived overseas. Which is pretty amazing. Oh, I'm so glad that you guys enjoyed it. I really, really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I was hoping that it was helpful. Yes, um, Bethany Rose says that she's had to say no and draw back from things she loved doing, but that in the end it was freeing. I agree. I think um, there's nothing quite like saying no and going and taking a nap. You're like, I feel bad. I'm missing out on something, but like this nap is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think when it comes to soul weariness and depression and some of those things, um, there's certainly a lot of different dynamics that play into it. I think being willing to open up about it, I think it's huge. Um, I would say, especially with soul weariness and with mental health, that um, being willing to search out wise people that give wise counsel is really, really important, whether that be, you know, a biblical counselor or talking to someone at your church. Or um, for me, I have some really dear close friends that understand a lot of um, just the emotional roller coaster, you know, sometimes it's not even something specific. Sometimes it's not even something particularly severe. I just find that emotions can be overwhelming. Um, and again, like I said, I have found that when I am exhausted, I feel like it's very hard to remain clear headed and know what I'm doing and know what I'm navigating. Um, and so being able to have safe people to process with and be able to go, okay, is my perspective here correct? Is my perspective on um, myself and on the situation, is this accurate? Or am I seeing things through a skewed perspective? I think that just having those, um, yeah, that help is really, really, really valid and important. Yeah. Um, and I think too with boundaries, um, there's an aspect of learning that you can't do everything um, and that there are going to be some good things that you have to let go um, because you want to be able to, in the long run, do something better, um, which is be able to protect your health and grow. And in some ways, I'd rather be able to say no to some things and get the rest that I need and be more clear headed and be more emotionally um, uplifted than try really hard to push through on something um, that ends up not actually being enjoyable because my emotional health wasn't great during that time anyway, if that makes sense. Yeah, I love using the blender. Um, we also have like a little uh, toaster oven. It's really, really nice. Yeah, grocery shopping and washing the dishes and it's a full workout. Yeah, I agree, Haley. <laughs> I hate doing dishes. Um, yeah, planning ahead, um, getting tasks done, realizing that some things aren't nearly as important as they might seem. Um, I would say too, with all of this and just with the emotional health stuff, um, for me, sometimes it's helpful too to do things that keep my brain off of how I'm feeling. Um, I listen to a lot of uh, like podcasts or YouTube videos or audiobooks when I'm just like hustling around the house doing things. Um, because I feel like, um, yeah, it, it helps me to stay more cheerful. Um, and if I'm having like my mental health, a lot of times I'll just be having a rough day where I'm dealing with a little bit of depression, but there's not necessarily like a specific reason for it. It's just one of those things, um, that comes with dealing with a chronic illness. Um, and it's not, you know, necessarily particularly severe. It's just there. And so for me to be able to, um, focus on something else, I think, um, I think distractions can be negative, but I think in some ways they can actually be positive in that it's shifting your focus off of yourself. Um, you know, you want to still be able to acknowledge your own mental health and your own, you know, situation. But I think being able to, um, yeah, to be aware of those things is is really helpful. 
Cool, thanks you guys for giving me questions. Yeah, I ap appreciate you guys typing question. Okay, um, so Bethany Rose asks, I would love to know how you scheduled your writing. I struggle to spend, oh, that's awesome. I struggle to spend, um, I struggle to write every day, especially since I spend a lot of time on nonfiction as well. Um, I didn't realize that these things, that these questions could pop up to be bigger, cool. Um, yeah, so as far as my writing goes, um, it's a lot of it has been learning my own process. Um, I really don't like first drafting. I find that the process of like staring at a blank page and putting a bunch of words down is probably the most emotionally exhausting, one of the most emotionally exhausting parts of the whole process. Once I have something written, then I can break it down and I just take it one sentence at a time and I fix it one sentence at a time and that's much easier on my brain. But that creative process of just like diving in and going for it when there's nothing written yet is really tiring. Um, so what I do is I outline well in advance because um, I used to not outline, but I found that outlining is helpful in that um, it gives me a lot of time to make sure all the pieces are in place because again, bad memory. So I am afraid that if I don't outline, I'm going to forget something important. So having an outline is, um, it gives me the sense of security of like, I got it done. It's all here. Um, and then I'm able to follow that pretty closely. And then what I do because I'm a little crazy, um, is I set aside, um, I can get a first draft written in about three months or less. So I set aside a chunk of time and I try to clear my schedule of other things as much as I can. Um, and I get I get paid to write somewhat. So um, I, I clear my schedule a little bit. And then I basically devote, I would say two to four hours every night um, before I go to bed. Uh, and I just write and I try to get um, a big chunk of writing done um, you know, several days a week for a period of like one to three months um, and just bust out a first draft. And that's probably like the craziest part of my year. Um, and then once I have that first draft done, um, and I find that just doing it fast is helpful for me. I also find that like, it's kind of exciting, um, like the first couple days of writing and trying to, you know, put, put out like 3000 words a day is exhausting. But the more that I do it, the more that I get into the flow of it, the more I stop thinking about it and I just go for it, the easier it gets. And then once I have that draft done, then it's it's easier to keep working from that point on. Um, and then from there, I just basically keep chipping away at it little by little, um, chapter by chapter, I'll read over it again, I'll finesse it myself, I'll tighten it up, um, depending on however much time and energy I have to spend on it. I'm a night owl. So I usually write at night. You guys are yeah, yeah, I love you a lot to be up this early. We'll put it that way. Um, but so I usually write at night before I go to bed um, because I like when the house is quiet and I have like fairy lights and it's very aesthetic. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I'll do that. Um, but it's just, it's finding different times for different things. Um, I will do marketing earlier on in the day if I'm doing that. Um, with writing nonfiction, I actually find that nonfiction in some ways is, is more emotionally exhausting because it takes so much thought and I'm trying to be so intentional with it. Um, so like writing my sessions uh, for, for this conference, um, I chipped away at it little by little. I wrote an outline and then I filled in the outline and then I went back through and I added a little bit more and I added a bit more and I added a bit more. Um, so it just it's just a process of like starting somewhere and then adding layers, if that makes sense. Um, and I go in knowing that my first draft, you know, my first outline, my first whatever is not going to necessarily work all that well, um, but to just basically keep, yeah, keep layering on and know that eventually it'll be close. Yeah. All right. Um, yes, Haley, I agree. I always feel relieved when I skip something. Um, all right. So Haley's next question is, how can I prioritize family relationships um, when I don't live with my family? Meaning it takes more energy to see things and do things with them. Yeah, so I would say when it comes to family relationships, there can be a lot of smaller ways that you can actually interact with them. Um, like for example, there's an app that I love and my, I actually live with my family. So I'm really, really blessed in that. But some of my best friends are long distance and so um, my friends and I chat a lot through an app called Marco Polo, and it's basically like a video app. 
it's like a video chatting app, but um, you're not on at the same time. So you basically record a video and then you send it and they can record reactions as they watch and then they record their video and send it back. So if you're in different time zones, if you're busy, whatever it is, it's just a way to communicate back and forth. And I find that it's really chill. Um, I can, you know, sit down and do it whenever I want. Um, you can actually, you know, use a picture and then just speak so you don't actually have to be on video all the time. Um, but like for someone who loves to talk and loves to have that communication or even just seeing people's expressions when you hear them talk, being able to communicate more in person, as it were, that's been really, really helpful. So I would say in some ways you can do things like that. You could um, use an app or text or video chat or some of those kinds of things. Um, and then as far as actually going to see them, I would just work on knowing, okay, how much energy am I going to need to save up for the trip? You know, how, um, how often can I go out and do things with them? When am I going to need to say, hey, I need a nap every afternoon? Those kinds of things. And so it's going to probably be, again, defining what your limitations are, communicating to them what you can do, and then scheduling in. Um, we're just making a conscious effort to figure out how to make that dynamic work well. All right, it looks like Sarah has a question next. As an author and a writing instructor, do you have any specific tips for guarding your energy when there are a lot of people who want your attention? <laughs> Thank you, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I would say limit your screen time if you can. Um, this is difficult for me, um, partially because I enjoy social things. Um, but I would say, um, for me, I found like there are certain ways that people will contact me and other ways that they won't engage as much. So like, um, you know, I will find, I will get a lot of, I will get bombarded a little bit on Instagram in a good way, but I will get a lot of messages on Instagram. I will get less engagement through my own personal email. So I know that if I'm getting an email, it's probably something that's more of a priority. And so I will tend to check my email and do that first before I'm going to look at something like Instagram or Facebook um, and that helps me to not feel like I have to respond right away. Um, a lot of it, I think, honestly, is being willing to set up those expectations clearly to begin with. Um, I try, depending on the situation, but I try not to respond right away to everything because I don't want to create an expectation that like, oh, Kara is always going to respond right away because it's just not, it's not realistic. And I don't want to let people feel let down if something doesn't happen quickly. People tend to be pretty gracious and understanding if you can't always jump right in and do something. Um, so that's been really, really helpful. Um, sometimes you just need to tell them, you know, say, hey, I am available, you know, during this time or I will be checking, you know, my messages or my email during this time or um, I will get back to you within a certain time frame. Um, a lot of times because, again, bad memory. I will tell people, hey, I would love to answer this. I don't have time right now, but I will get back to you. If you don't hear from me in a week, follow up again. Um, because that way it's back in their court a little bit too. And if I can't get to it on time, then it's like, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, so I find that that's helpful. Um, so a lot of times it's just, it's figuring out whatever those boundaries need to look like, whether that be your, you know, not, not on there as often, you're letting people know you have to respond within a certain time frame all those different kinds of things and it is hard and it is hard when you're interacting with people in a way that's a ministry as well you know you want to be able to um yeah to be gracious with that cool all right let's see next question All right, Abby asks, as an author, how do you know when it's time for you to stop and to listen versus when to push through? Yeah, it's really hard. Um, I think a lot of this comes with practice. The more that you do things, um, the more you learn. There's always going to be a time when things are difficult. Um, I would say mental health is a fairly good indication that you're pushing too hard. Um, because if you're dealing with um, well, so there's, I guess there's different ways to, to, to put this. Um, when I wrote Dust, this fancy book right here, um, I was going through like one of the worst seasons of depression that I'd ever gone through. Um, and it wasn't because of the book. It was because of the season that I was in. Um, and the book was actually really helpful because it gave me an outlet to basically preach truth to myself when I wasn't feeling like it. 
Um, and so in that case, I needed to be able to push through. I really needed to be able to do that and learn those truths for myself um, because it was important. And I was also on deadline. Um, so that was also, I had a commitment that I had to basically fulfill. However, if you are pushing yourself so hard that like you're fine at first, but then over time you find that you're just exhausted and you're feeling depressed and you're feeling a little bit um, anxious and just um, you feel like your own emotional state isn't well, that could be an indication that you're just pushing too hard um, in that aspect. Uh, I would say consistency over forcing yourself to do more than you can. Um, I would say I would rather you write like, you know, 200 words every day than write like 3000 and then crash. Um, so I would start small, do what you can work your way up. I didn't start at 3000. Um, I love you 3000. Sorry, Marvel nerd. Anyway, um, I started at a smaller amount of words and then I worked my way up. Um, and I found that 3000 is about the solid amount that I can do without feeling like pushed over the edge and exhausted. Um, but it's just enough. It's about, that's basically the equivalent of writing like a chapter, something like that. Um, so yeah. Yes, Bethany Rose agrees with me that fiction first drafts are so emotionally exhausting. Um, definitely. I think too, because your first draft, you're mainly focusing in on the characters. And so you're just channeling a lot of emotions. Um, yeah, fairy lights are the best. Yeah, word quotas are hard on your emotional health, but in some ways they can be helpful. It's just finding your balance. It's finding what works for you in that. Um, another thing that helps with writing is I have a couple of alpha readers um, that are basically just like my cheerleaders. They basically just help me stay excited and they remind me that the book isn't total trash because when I'm writing it, it feels awful. And so um, they'll read as I write chapters, they'll read my really rough drafts and they won't give a ton of feedback because they don't want to slow me down, but they'll just make sure that I'm not going off on some tangent and they'll make sure um, that I'm encouraged. Yeah, definitely sitting down um, and thinking through boundaries is good. I'm glad I'm not the only Marvel nerd. Um, yeah, even just five minutes from family feels like a lot when you're flaring up. Everything feels like a lot when you're not doing so well. Um, I'm so glad that this was helpful. All right, we have a little bit of time. Let me know if you guys have any more questions. Yes, alpha readers are really helpful. Yeah, I have like two or three alphas that I use. Um, yeah. Thanks again, you guys, for showing up. It probably is less early wherever you are at, hopefully. Um, yeah, some of it too is I'm just not a morning person. Well, thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Haley. Um, they asked how they can pray for me. Um, yeah, good question. Uh, let's see. Um, sorry, my huskies are barking in the background. <laughs> um, I just think lately, like a couple words that have been on my heart a lot lately have been like discernment and sanctification and security. Um, I feel like I've been just praying a lot for discernment lately in different different areas, um, whether that be in relationships with people around me or um, picking up new uh, responsibilities in ministry or in writing related things. Um, just having wisdom in all of these different areas. Um, yeah, I, as my health continues to actually improve, which has been amazing, just knowing where to push and where not to, um, you know, wanting to do more, um, whether that be traveling to events if I can, or, you know, picking up a little bit more time work-wise or that kind of thing. And so I feel like discernment has been really important. Um, sanctification. I feel like God's been teaching me a lot lately. Um, just like, um, I think I said this in the other, sorry, the dogs. I think I said this in the other session, but I feel like for so long, um, I was so focused on in some ways, like boundaries within my physical health and making sure that I didn't push myself too hard that suddenly having more energy and being able to feel better 
um, I'm realizing that, um, yeah, I'm realizing that um, it, God is working on my heart in ways that I think I hadn't been able to see before because I was so focused on health, you know, and survival um, that now I feel like he's been just, yeah, reaching into things um, with my heart and working through stuff like that. And so think sanctification there. And then also security. I've been really blessed and just comforted lately with the reminder of how good our God is and how when life can sometimes feel like this emotional roller coaster that he is steady and, um, you know, our, our future is secure in him and our hope is secure in him. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yes. Any last questions for me? tell you about my books. <laughs> um, yeah. How about I just read you guys the back of this one? Wow, you're getting the back cover read by the author. Isn't that fancy? Um, <clears throat> the truth about Neverland is far more dangerous than a fairy tale. Claire Kitten believes the world is too dark for magic to be real, since her twin brother was stolen away as a child. Now, Claire's desperate search points to London and a boy who shouldn't exist. Peter Pan is having a beastly time getting back to Neverland. Grounded in London and hunted by his own lost boys, Peter searches for his last hope of restoring his crumbling island, a lass with magic in her veins. Now, the girl who fears her own destiny is on a collision course with the boy who never wanted to grow up. The truth behind this fairy tale is about to unravel everything Claire thought she knew about Peter Pan and herself. Da -da -da -da. Um, so dust is like, I feel like this book is kind of my trust fall in the sense that, like I said, I wrote it during a season of depression. Um, it came about really strangely. Oh, uh, thanks you guys for pre-ordering Dust. Yeah, so it's a Peter Pan retelling slash sequel, which is crazy. Um, so I like Peter Pan, but I have never been like a massive Peter Pan fanatic um, because I always like, I, I like Peter Pan, but I feel like I've always had a fairly good knowledge of who he was and the fact that he's kind of like a little selfish child um who has some like really good um yeah the pre-order link is in the description um he has some really good attributes but he's also a little bit of a selfish snot sometimes let's be real um and so basically what happened is several years ago a friend and i were just jokingly talking about fairy tale retellings and i think we ended up talking about how there's very few peter pan ones um and i mentioned how I'm not generally a fan of Peter Pan retellings because I feel like they tend to change what makes Peter Peter. Um, and they tend to uh, either make him evil or make Hook good or make Peter a girl or, you know, whatever it is. And they take away the magic of Peter Pan, um, you know, because we've seen we've seen pirates before. We've seen fairies before. We've seen a lot of these things. Um, but it's like Peter and his quirkiness and who he is as a character that's really fascinating. And so I had said that, um, so I just jokingly told her like, hey, if I ever wrote a Peter Pan retelling, which I'm not gonna do, um, I would write it as almost like a sequel. I would set it in modern times, kind of in the future. It would launch off of the original book, have a lot of the same characters, um, but it would basically be a continuation of like, what happened if Peter actually had to take responsibility for his actions? Um, because in the original J.M. Barry book, he does some super sketchy stuff, you guys. Um, like at one point he, kind of halfway accidentally, mostly on purpose, kills off the Lost Boys because he gets bored of them. And yeah, like stuff happens. So um, I had said, you know, I thought it'd be really interesting. I think a lot of a lot of Peter's issues is that because he's so young, he doesn't see any responsibility for his actions. So he'll do things that are rather devious. Um, but because he doesn't see anybody get hurt, he thinks it's fine. And so he just continues being selfish. And so I told my friend, I thought it'd be really fascinating to tell a story where Peter had to take responsibility a little bit um, and keep him still very Peterish, but kind of push those boundaries and see what would happen if he was basically stranded in London without magic, forced to grow up just a little bit, age up a little bit, um, and then basically had to find his own way back to Neverland and um, uh, yeah, come to grips with some of these things a little bit. Um, and then I also said that if I did that, I would have the other chapters be from a character that I created um, who would kind of represent all of us who were left behind, those of us who didn't get to go to Neverland, who 
have experienced an awful lot of dark things um, and who you know feel like the world is very shadowed and um, have kind of Peter's journey be of him learning that um, you know growing up really isn't about losing the magic but it's just about learning to care and learning to take responsibility and learning to protect what you care about and what matters um, and that you can actually still do that and still maintain the magic and maintain hope and those kinds of things. Um, and have Claire come to understand that there is still beauty and there is still things that might feel impossible um, and that there is light even when, you know, the sky might seem dark. Um, there are still stars out there. So anyway, so I had this weird concept. And um, so I ended up sort of mentioning the idea at a writer's conference a couple of years ago. And everyone that I sort of mentioned it to of like, hey, you know, like, would this be a thing? Every single publisher was so excited, um, which was crazy. And so basically what happened um, was there was a lot of back and forth, but then um, I want to say two years ago, um, a publisher stumbled across the idea when my agent and I were pitching different things and basically said, Peter Pan retelling, that sounds really interesting. We haven't seen that before. If you write it, we'll consider it. Um, and this was one of the biggest publishers in like the country. <laughs> and so I was pretty surprised um, in the sense that I was like, I don't know how to write this book. It's Peter Pan. How do I write a character that's, you know, so classic and everybody has their own translation and their own like image in their head of who he is? How do I write this? But because the publisher wanted it, I feel like that was the um, the motivation that I needed to actually sit down and do it. Um, but it's been one of the hardest things for sure because of wanting to do it justice and then working on this book while dealing with mental health and chronic illness and stuff like that. Um, but I think that it's powerful in its own way because of working through those types of things. Um, yes, I love the, the live action universal version of Peter Pan. It makes me cry every time. Like, I'll go with you, Peter. I'll go back. Um, I have lots of feelings on Wendy. <laughs> um, there's a reason she's not in dust. No, I don't mind Wendy that much. I don't feel like she was, I don't feel like she was ultimately what Peter really needed. I don't think she understood him. Um, yes, I have feelings. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah. Yeah. So anyway. Well, thank you so much, Kara. I look forward to reading Dust and thank, thank you for sharing about it and enjoying the reviews. They're beautiful. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, if anybody wants to hasn't pre-ordered it and is interested in it or wants to read the blurb again, you know, you can go to there's a description in the um link of uh there's a link in the description of this video uh for that so you can go look at that. Uh, that was a wonderful session, Kara. I definitely need to work on boundaries in my own life. Yeah. I think it's um, an ongoing process for sure. Yeah. So just a reminder, everyone, if you haven't yet gotten the study guide, there is the ebook version. There's a link in the description of this video. It is free. Uh, or you can get the paperback version. If you prefer something, you can write in and hold it. Um, so that's also in uh, the, there's a link in the description of this video. <clears throat> um, also, at the end of every session, we are doing a giveaway. So the giveaway prize for this session is a set of art note cards provided by Chronic Joy Ministry. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the note cards are just, I love it. The, when they send them, you know, you can just write in them and stick them in the mail. And it's just a bright... Uh, a way to brighten someone's day. So the winner of that is Heather. There's two winners since we're giving away two sets. So the winner, first winner is Heather Hall. Congratulations, Heather. And the second winner is Becca. Congratulations, Becca. Um, we will email you with more information about that once you come to the table. So if you haven't entered the giveaway, you guys can go ahead and do that at the link down in the description of this video to go to the conference website. If you scroll all the way down to the bottom, that's where the giveaway stuff is. And there's freebies too. If you haven't won a giveaway, there's freebies that everyone gets. So make sure you go look at those things. Um, and also, I just wanted to say the conference isn't over yet. We still have one more day, you know, this whole day today of it. And there are so many amazing speakers and so many amazing sessions like Paris. And you can you make, you know, as chronically ill people, we don't necessarily get to invite people places very much because we're often stuck at home ourselves or whatever. So if you guys know anyone who is going through a hard thing, 
go ahead and invite them to register because, um, yeah, it's not too late. So just wanted to encourage you to do that. But we are going to go to the next session, um, which is about chronic illness in the workplace, which is um, another uh, exciting topic. Um, and that's going to be taught by Haley Rose. So if uh, you can go ahead and click the, click the link below to go to the next session and we'll see you over